what I wanted to do today is first sort of uh, give you uh, my overview on how I feel astrophysical surveys have been evolving uh, and then tell you why that sort of uh, implies that we need these alert broker systems. So, uh, so every astrophysical survey that I have been a part of likes to highlight how they are bigger, better, uh, go deeper and find more sources. And so for Ruben, which is what I have been part of for a very long time now, uh, we show people things like this. So if you look at uh, you know, early photographic plates, this is sort of what you might see. Uh, and going from that to something like the Digital Sky Survey, you can immediately see how CCDs have changed things and revolutionized how uh, deep you can go, uh, how, how uh, much resolution you can see on sources, but you're still looking at sort of the relatively nearby universe. So as you go deeper with larger aperture telescopes, uh, but potentially smaller field of view, you're seeing richer fields, you're seeing more sources, more distant sources in the universe, uh, and, and potentially fainter sources that are nearby as well. And LSST's big trick is to do this, of course, uh, with a much wider field of view than any other instrument there is. So with a nine square degree field of view uh, for a single exposure and the ability to scan the entire southern sky every four nights, it'll have something like 37 billion stars and galaxies over the full 10 year survey. Uh, and every single night, it'll produce something like 10 million alerts. What's an alert you ask? Well, if you see these galaxies uh, in this sort of image, uh, and you come back at a later time and take another picture of the same galaxy, you can subtract the two of them off. There's a little bit of convolution trickery going on there. But every now and then you'll find a source that has changed between those two images. And that source in the difference image is what leads to an alert. It is a significant detection, either positive or negative, in a difference image. And that's the core of what you see. Uh, now, to give you a sense of just how large LSST is, I want to play this animation uh, by my grad student, Alex Galliano. So what we're going to do is, is uh, show you all of the historical supernovae that has ever happened until around 2020. And this will go fairly quickly in time, and you'll see little flashes here and there on your screen there, for example, and you'll see as time goes on, you're starting to find more and more of these objects. Uh, and then you go from photographic plates to CCDs, you see Sloan Digital Sky Survey turning on. So for example, you get Stripe 82. And so sometime around last year, you were around 20,000 supernovae. This is really great, right? Uh, but this is the accumulated total of all spectroscopically confirmed supernova that we found from a whole bunch of these surveys over, well, actually more than just decades, centuries. Uh, and to give you a sense of how LSST is, LSST will do more than this in six months. So in other words, LSST's alert rate outstrips all of our follow-up resources combined, you could give me every hour on every spectroscopic facility on the planet, and there would still not be enough time to follow every LSST transient. It's just simply not possible. And the core reason for that is that the field of view of all of these eight meter class telescopes is minuscule compared to LSST's enormous field of view, which is something like seven full moons across. The other challenge that we have is the time domain and transient sky is extremely varied. People are interested in different sorts of objects. So for example, I am personally interested in things like supernovae, particularly type 1a supernovae, to measure the expansion history of the universe. I'm also interested in things like kilonovae. But my colleague, for example, Professor Decker French, who's just down the corridor for me, works on tidal disruption events, as do some of you. Uh, and there are folks here who work on things like active galactic nuclei, I'm sure, uh, and are interested in finding things like changing of AGN. And so we have very different interests for what we want out of the alert stream from LSST. But the bulk of the alerts that will happen from LSST will be sort of in three broad categories. And they'll serve three large scientific communities, DESC, which I'm part of, as well as TVSSC. Uh, so that's the transient and variable star science community. And then of course, what we'll see else is uh, AGN and things of that nature. And so you'll see a whole bunch of these sources uh, in the LSST alert stream. Uh, and they are very different in what sort of science people want to do, what sort of time scales people want to study uh, with these kind of alerts. 
Uh, there's, of course, a whole category of sources that I haven't talked about, sources that are multi-messages. So zooming into the source, you saw that blue contour of the LIGO, Virgo, Kagra uh, localization region for GW170817. Uh, and of course, as uh, you zoom in, you were able to actually localize this one multi-messenger source uh, and go get a whole bunch of follow-up spectroscopy of it, uh, which is critical because it faded very rapidly and by sort of uh, 11 days was much less bright and much harder to study without uh, having Hubble, for example. Uh, and so one of the things that we have to do in the coming decade for big surveys is not just look at surveys individually, but to make optimum use of them, you have to combine data from different sources. And we have one example of being able to do this successfully in GW170817, but it was extraordinarily hard and took a huge coordinated community effort with a whole bunch of manual intervention to schedule observations, to point telescopes, to get at this discretionary time. And that's sort of simply not sustainable when you get to the point of having 10 million alerts every single week. How do you find something uh, like GW170817 in that mess? It's really hard because it's not a question of trying to find a needle in a haystack. It's trying to find a needle within another stack of needles. The things that all look very, very similar. Needles in a haystack are actually a really easy problem. If you want to find a needle in a haystack, just burn the haystack. And so the sort of traditional way we do data releases is completely not suitable for this kind of science. So if you have a traditional archive, and I know groups like CTA are thinking of things like this, you can go in and say, search for M100 or some source, and it'll give you after some proprietary period is over or for your own uh, proprietary proposal, a list of all of the raw images that you can have. Maybe you get some image processing with it, uh, but there's no catalog level data for any of these sources. Uh, in general, you'll have to download them. You'll have to uh, take them onto your own laptop or high performance cluster and do your own analysis of them, identify sources. And so this process has a huge amount of latency. And if you tell me that you know we're doing this for Hubble and of course Hubble is old, I'll point out that this is the same exact technology being used for JWST. It's the same technology being used for TESS. It's the same technology being used for a whole bunch of other surveys. And things haven't changed a huge amount since this. Uh, the big sort of update effectively was SDSS gas jobs, which gave you instead of having just raw images, access to catalog level data. So useful data products that were from processing on those images. And you could write your own SQL query and every now and then SDSS will do a massive data release and now you have better data or more sources uh, going deeper. And this is again, the mode of operation of ongoing experiments like Gaia. There is no easy way to get real-time Gaia alerts right now. So we need to, going forward, find a better way to filter. So this is a cartoon that Pete Marinfield um, drew when I was at NOA, when a postdoc. Uh, and the real issue, of course, is uh, volume and rate. Uh, and you are trying to find objects that are common, but also be able to identify extremely rare sources. And uh, for those of you who are uh, amused by, by this, uh, yes, it's me on the left-hand side. And you may recognize my colleagues, Professor Hana Yanami and Colette Salek, who are uh, postdocs at the same time at me as NOAO. Uh, that's even a direct picture of the whiteboard that was in my office at the time. Uh, so they just cartoonified us. So the key challenge then is not just building a survey that gets better data, bigger instruments, bigger facilities that go deeper. It's to really figure out how to get that data to the community quickly to use it. And for the time domain, this implies something. It means that you have to deal with real-time data streams. You can't just wait for periodic data releases every year. And you have to process data from heterogeneous sources. It's not a question of what can I do with just CTA? It is what can I do with CTA and Rubin Observatory and CMBS4 and all of these other experiments all together at the same time, Ice Cube, for example. Uh, and that is a much harder challenge because none of that data currently comes out to us in any kind of standard format. How do you process that? To answer that question, we came up with this concept of a middleman much like a stockbroker takes your requirements and tries to find a stock portfolio that matches your needs and, and 
figures out exactly what you need. Uh, alert brokers in the middle are doing that, except not with stocks, but with rather real-time alerts from ongoing surveys. I should mention at any point, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me and, and uh, I'll happily take them. So what do we actually need uh, based on those last few slides that I went through? We need something to set, sift through these heterogeneous alert streams in real time. We want to characterize and classify the events that are in the alert stream. We want to identify things that are potentially rare, so outlier characterization in particular. We want to be able to prioritize events for follow-up automatically rather than have a human, like some grad student figure out, oh, I want this object. That's simply not going to scale when you have 10 million alerts every single night. There's no way a human can even look through all of them. And you want to actively learn from that follow-up. You want to have a system that improves over time and gets better and better with every classified spectrum. So the core functionality then is to do all of the above and provide a search and filtering and compute service to the entire community. So the core part of what a broker does, I think, is this box region over here. Now, there are a few different brokers out there. Uh, it's not a huge amount. It's a, it's a handful, something on the order of like six to eight. Uh, and this will also be about the number that LSSD supports um, in their ongoing operations. So how LSSD will actually interact with this is LSSD is not going to run a broker on its own, but rather as part of its own processing, uh, they will create poster stamps and alerts from the different images. Those will go into a message queue uh, implemented by a technology called Kafka, and those get broadcasted to these community alert brokers, including the one that I work on, Antares. And, and you, the user, or you, another science collaboration, connect to the brokers rather than to LSSD directly. And there is another method of access uh, that is sort of in the same vein as, as what I showed you with SDSS's cast job. And that is through things like the Rubin Science Platform. So every now and then there will be a yearly data release, for example, that will go onto the Science Platform and it will give you the same sort of uh, SQL tools to query that database, but also uh, something like a Jupyter Hub environment to do more complex analysis than was possible. Okay. So the alerts themselves right now come in the form of what is called a Apache Kafka queue. Uh, so these Kafka is a technology that was developed by the Apache Software Foundation, the same sort of uh, group that, that, for example, uh, constructed uh, the sort of web servers that you're familiar with for most everything. Uh, and it can have several different producers. And for producer here, fill in groups like LSST or CTA or IceCube or whatever else. Uh, and they produce records that go into topics. Topics, for example, can be things like supernovae or last night's clothes. Uh, so they can be very generally uh, defined. And those in turn get connected to a Queue through a queue system through the consumers. Here, what we're really talking about are the broker systems that will actually be listening to these groups. But you can also imagine uh, the brokers run an instance of this exact same thing and use the same sort of technology to talk directly to the users themselves. Now, the nice thing about Kafka is it's extremely fault tolerant. Uh, can, consumers can disconnect, there can be new messages pushed in the queue. Once they reconnect, they'll simply pick up from where they left off. There's a buffer of up to like a week. It's a system that guarantees at least once message delivery. You can have more than one repeated message, but at least you'll get one copy of it. Uh, so hopefully nothing gets dropped. Uh, it has, um, it's very efficient in the way it serializes its data and sends it out. And it's particularly the case when you also combine how you send the data in the form of Kafka with what data you send in the form of the format. So the format that's being used for alerts right now is this thing called Apache Avro, uh, which is effectively a serialized JSON uh, uh, schema that encodes a whole bunch of data. Uh, I've put in LSSD's own alert packet example and schema for folks here at the CTA to start thinking about. And I think of this entire ecosystem of Kafka plus Avro as very much a successor to VOMN. VOMN has, of course, been along for a lot longer, but the mere fact that big surveys like this Wiki Transient facility and soon LSSD and LIGO Virgo Kagra, uh, as well as groups like SNews and such, are starting to use uh, Kafka directly or a thing called Hopscotch, we'll talk about in a second, mean that 
in the couple of years that ZTF has been running, there are now vastly more alerts that have been sent out over Kafka with Avro packets than VO events have done in their entire existence. Uh, and currently access management for uh, these consumers is very basic. It's just in the form of an IP whitelist, uh, but a group called the Scalable Cyber Infrastructure for Multi-Messenger Astrophysics, which I'm a part of, SIMA, uh, is adding this identity and access management layer to all of this Kafka infrastructure. Uh, and they call that product Hopscotch. Uh, and so Hopscotch, I think, will become very much the standard over the next few years for how these alerts are sent out from big astrophysical surveys to broker systems to eventually get to consumers. So how my first suggestion for how CTA can for, sort of engage in this ecosystem, which is what Albert told me that I needed to sort of emphasize, uh, is to start to work with these groups that have already started uh, paving the way to getting alerts in the time domain. So SIMA, Rubin Observatory, ZTF, there are examples for the uh, data distribution system, Kafka uh, and, and Avro packets uh, out there. Uh, you can of course have now multiple years of ZTF operations to have example sample data. Uh, and it's pretty easily adaptable, and I'll show you this in a few slides, um, to any other survey. So brokers then are the things that are receiving the alerts from these big surveys like LSST or ZTF or through other groups like AMON, which is uh, another uh, multi-messenger monitoring network that I think you heard about in the last CTA colloquium, uh, CTA webinar rather. Uh, and what brokers then do is, of course, manage these alert scripts. So they add contextual information, they help you characterize these sources, they want to annotate, rank, and distribute, and, and classify them to the community. Uh, so the community, for example, can listen to this directly, but you can also have completely automated pipelines uh, listening to these things, things like telescope observatory managers or TOMs, which connect directly to telescopes for automatic follow-up, for example. So you can imagine a pipeline, for example, where we issue an alert from a survey like LSST, a broker like Antares characterizes it completely and says, hey, this matches your criterion for an interesting rising early young supernova. And because you have also asked us to connect it up to the storms, we will now issue an alert that says, trigger your observing program and point your telescope at the source. And the important thing here is that sort of latency for multi-master astrophysics really drops down from a few days to a few hours to now a few minutes to potentially seconds. The core ability of brokers is enabled by not defining the science that you want to do ourselves, but rather letting you write your own filters. So if you want to do any kind of complex targeted processing of a large amount of data sets, write a little bit of code in Python and we will run your code for you in real time on this alert screen. So this really lets you correlate optical, gravitational wave, high energy particle neutrino tickers for multi messenger astrophysics. And it's already up and running. So you can sign up and Antares will start processing ZTF data for you with your own filters uh, should you want to do any kind of exploratory analysis. Uh, and I wanted to highlight the people that are really, really crucial here. Antares now actually also apologize for this since uh, I'm, in, I'm in the context of a bunch of uh, uh, particle astrophysicists. Antares has nothing to do with the particle astrophysics experiment. Uh, the, the acronym stands for the Arizona NOAA Lab Transient uh, Alert and Response to Event System. Uh, which is also no longer accurate because initially it was NOAO and NOAA Lab has, NOAO has been renamed NOAA Lab plus people who were at NOAA Lab are now all over the country. Monica Sadaisam here is uh, with me at uh, Illinois. Then are now uh, folks in, in uh, Hawaii, for example, uh, who are working with it. But these are the core folks who have de uh, developed Antares. So uh, Monica, uh, Chen Shu Li, and Tom Matheson are the core science people uh, along with me. And, Nick Wolf, Adam Scott, and Carl Sturbins in the core uh, development people. So rather than sort of just show you static slides, I figured what I will do is stop sharing my screen, my slideshow, uh, and instead share um, my, my web browser and just give you a walkthrough of how the system looks in honest to goodness real time with a completely vanilla generic user account. Uh, that's my own account here. 
uh, that I have no special privileges, nothing, nothing that I will show you is something that you cannot do yourself. Uh, if you are looking at this presentation later on uh, in just the slideshow format, uh, there are slides that sort of will walk you through what I'm doing and give you links to things like example notebooks um, and so on and so forth. Now, the alerts from entities come in the form of these objects from ZTF. Uh, you can sort of decide that you only want to, for example, look at objects where the latest alert was within the last week. Uh, and maybe you want to limit the number of measurements it has. Maybe you want to ask, for example, if people here are particularly interested in galaxies, we can demand that it is cross-associated with SDSS catalogs. Uh, so NYU's value added catalog. Maybe you also are particularly interested in AGN, so we can uh, see if we can find uh, something that, that satisfies all of those criteria. And sure enough, uh, after a couple of seconds of processing, uh, my screen here is moving a little bit slower than uh, the Zoom window is updating a little bit slower than my actual screen. So this takes literally no time at all. Uh, you get all the latest alerts. And so, uh, I have no idea what any of these things are. So I'm just going to click completely random at one of these sources. Uh, let's look at one that has just a, a few alerts at least. Uh, so this one, for example, has two alerts at a location. You can see the sort of light curve that you get from ZTF. And you can see the last couple of detections where it has apparently arisen. You can get something like a poster stamp. You can see where these detections are. Uh, and you can see the associations for this particular object. So for example, I requested that it was in NYU's value a Galaxy catalog. So everything that is in NYU's value a Galaxy catalog uh, shows up here. Uh, and so you can do all of this stuff through just the web page, uh, but you can also require alerts that meet other people's filtering criterion. Uh, so let's just clear some of the, these criteria off because uh, often if I use a filter, I'm using a much more uh, selective record uh, and uh, who knows exactly what you'll find. So you can see that we have a bunch of criteria uh, that are effectively tags. So filters create little tags that you can look at uh, and those tags define whether an object is interesting or not. These tags already have the, uh, the particular uh, sources identified. Most of the names are reasonably self-explanatory. Otherwise, there's a little table that explains what they are. But let's just say we're looking at nuclear transits. Why not? Uh, so you can get your list now with that tag associated with it uh, and look at things that are just nuclear transits. You can also get at this through the filters directly. So you can go in here and create your own, for example, uh, or look at any of the tags. So for example, I can look at uh, Monica Sarayasam's tag for uh, subluminous supernovae. Um, and you, you could sort this thing, of course, however you like. Uh, I am going to, I think, sort by things that are relatively recent in time uh, and maybe by brightness. Uh, those seem like sensible things to sort out for me. Um, how do we keep brightnesses in ascending order thing? And again, I'm going to just pick one completely random. I, okay, that's a cool one. Um, so that uh, looks like a regular supernova to me. Uh, completely random again here. I'm just picking whatever I found. You can find uh, the galaxy it's in, any catalog information that it has. Uh, so for example, this is uh, in an SDSS galaxy, so all of its magnitudes are here. And this is really just using Monica's code to find it. Uh, I'm going to actually bet that this particular source is a classified supernova because it's it's uh, gotten to 18.5. And uh, since I'm a supernova person, I can tell by roughly the rise time that this is probably a uh, co-collab supernova, probably a type two of some sort. Uh, let's go to the transient name server and check if I did that reasonably well. And uh, let's see, that is in fact an entry. I can see the SN um, and there is a spectrum. There is a hydrogen line that is for sure a co-collapse type two supernova. Um, and in fact, it was classified by Francisco Foster and the University Group, which is one of the other broker systems out there. Um, so this is, this is a quick example of how this infrastructure can very quickly let you find and discover sources in these large alert streams. ETF is sending out something like a million alerts per night. But with a few clicks of my mouse through this web interface, I was able to, to very quickly identify uh, and uh, find this interesting odd source. Um, and of course, this tag 
Sarai, Monica's uh, subluminous tag uh, may not be exactly what you want for your science, but you can actually see your own science uh, uh, codes by simply checking out how our tags are created. So for example, if you want to see, for example, how our high amplitude tag is created, uh, simply expand that code and you'll get the Python code that our system runs on the ZTF load stream. This is a user contributed code. Uh, and you can write your own version of this code uh, to do this. So, for example, if you go to the uh, Jupyter Lab uh, environment that Antares, uh, that uh, NOAO's data lab hosts, one of the notebooks that you'll be able to find there is this Antares filter development kit. And this is sim a simple Jupyter notebook that simply walks you through how to create, how to connect to our server, how to uh, write your own filter from scratch as a bit of Python code uh, and do your own science. And you have access to any of the properties created by any of the other filters, but also all of the properties in the alerts themselves. So again, here is where I'm going to quickly show you the Avro schema of what's in an alert. Each detection, each source uh, comes with whatever is in that one particular image. And so this is LSSD's format, but it's very close to what ZTF is using anyway. So you get the obvious things like RA and declination, of course, but you also get things like the aperture flux, and the PSF flux, and so on and so on. Uh, if it's trailed, for example, if you're looking for solar system sources, uh, if there's a dipole, for example, to do kind of any kind of distinguishing between real and bogus sources, you have all of these things. And so you can write any filter that you want that uses any of these properties plus anything that we compute ourselves within Antares. Uh, so it's an extraordinarily rich ecosystem that you're effectively becoming part of when you start sending out your alerts in real time rather than doing a annual data release. It gives you the ability as a scientist to sort of look at these sources very, very quickly and do all sorts of analysis in no time whatsoever. Uh, so in addition to sort of typical filters, maybe you have a list of known sources, your own little catalog, you can create a watch list for that catalog and simply update uh, and they'll simply give you a Slack notification alert or let you know. And the watch list is really very simple. It's just a CSV file with an RA and deck in a radius. And every time that source has a new alert from any survey, not just LSST or ZTF, but potentially CTA itself or say, if we connect up to ice cubes alerts through Amon, for example, uh, you can get your alerts. They can go out in the Slack channel, so you can have your phone ding at you as much as you like or as little as you like. Um, and filters uh, are more a more complicated version of watchlist. But again, you can write your own code and submit it uh, any way you like. And the Jupyter notebook environment, for example, uh, that I showed you, the dev kit lets you write your own filters. These can be. Uh, for example, quite complicated things. So I'm showing you here a filter that I wrote for uh, Ogle's microlensing project that actually will, for example, do a, a full lens model fit to a microlensing event and try to identify events in real time that, that look achromatic and have the characteristic uh, rise scale for uh, microlensing source. And so these are very generic. It's very efficient uh, Python code that's run in parallel, uh, currently on a cluster at uh, the University of Arizona, but we're shifting all of this infrastructure very quickly to Google's own cloud platform. Uh, so I've shown you, for example, uh, how to create your filters, how to uh, for, uh, create a watch list, how to, if you have your own catalogs, we can also uh, add them, for example, so you can see all of our current catalog holdings here in Antares, uh, along with example alerts for every single one of these things. Uh, you don't have to uh, look through all of this right now, but there's just a whole lot to see. But of course, that's not good enough for some folks. You might want to do a little bit more even. So you might want to build your own real-time pipeline around this thing and not be going to websites in your browser to see. So there's a Python uh, client that lets you do everything that you can do on a website, but now programmatically with an API uh, on your own computer. So this means that you can, for example, do all of the things I, I showed you, uh, find interesting events in a alert stream, run Python code on them to identify particularly uh, outlying objects, but you can now also connect it up with a broader ecosystem. So I'm going to quickly sh stop sharing here and, and go back to my slides and show you what I mean by that. So 
So let's come down to roughly around here. So the API lets you query everything that you would have gotten from the website, but now in a Python client, for example, any of the loci lookups uh, that I did through the browser, you can now do in a Jupyter notebook, uh, for example, at some RA and deck with some uh, cone search radius that you like, you'll get a whole bunch of objects. And that of course lets you do things like look at an ensemble of sources all at once rather than one by one on a web page. If you want to, for example, create a color magnitude diagram, you can do that, you can find outlying sources that are non-stellar, uh, and you can get a whole bunch of real objects from this real-time stream that match your criteria without having waited for a year for a database. This is a really powerful thing. This example notebook, there's a link to that uh, notebook right here. Uh, so you can go around and play with it and use it to identify your own variable sources. And of course, I'm this example is done for variable stars, but you could do this for any other source that you might like. For example, changing look AGN, uh, if that's your interest, or sources uh, like quasars or, or uh, lens systems, where you know where the locations of each of the multiple images are. Uh, there's anything that you can imagine, basically, and can write in Python, you can implement quite easily. Uh, you can also have queries that are just pure SQL uh, and uh, done against our database. This is actually how this was implemented uh, and uh, return uh, those matches instead of using filters or anything of that sort. So this is very much a combination of what was possible with things like cast jobs, but an evolution of that into these real-time systems. Uh, and the real nifty trick is when you go beyond just, hey, I'm analyzing sources uh, and finding interesting objects, but you decide to do something with those sources. You decide to do follow-up. So if you can convince a tack to give you some telescope time uh, with whatever resource you particularly like, maybe Swift or whatever else, and you can find an object of uh, interest in the stream. And this facility is connected up with something like a telescope observatory management system. Then you can create a follow-up observation request completely programmatically uh, within Antares or within your own notebook using the API client to query Antares. You can run it through your exposure time calculator and set the exposure time the right way. And then you can submit that observation request. And there's an entire way to do that with this, this Aeon Tom system that currently exists and supports Gemini as well as the Las Cumbres Observatory facilities. Uh, and Sure enough, for that particular object, you can submit a real honest to goodness uh, request to observe it on the observing portal that you get from LCO. Uh, and it will go off and trigger one of their facilities, like say Siding Springs or whatever, and get you an image. All in real time, no human in the loop potentially. Uh, you don't have to have people vetting each of these requests. You can simply define a strong enough pressure, uh, trigger criterion that you have this observation follow automatically when your filter triggers all in real time. That's cool. And that's a good way to try to deal with an alert stream when you have 10 million alerts every single night, because you could put all of the grad students you have to try to find interesting objects and they won't be consistent and cannot possibly sustain that level of effort for 10 years of elasticity in any case. So you'll have to sort of move to this environment. And you can see how this is really, really powerful for multi-messenger astrophysics. If we had had this sort of thing back in 2017, instead of waiting four and a half hours uh, to trigger on GW1708.17, we could have potentially done it within minutes. So there's all sorts of science use cases that this sort of uh, specifies. I, for example, am particularly interested in dichromate cosmology. Now, I don't need spectroscopy for all of those objects, but I can get uh, targeted spectroscopy for a few that, for example, fit uh, particular constraints. So maybe they have really, they were discovered really early, or maybe they're in a particular redshift range, or maybe I want a random sample to assess my selection bias. Uh, and so this is a sort of transience on demand science case that, that matches up with that. Uh, and because we did this entire connection up with the TOM systems and can trigger real time sources, you can, for example, find an interesting source within CTA data. You can set it out in your own CTA alert stream to one of these brokers. You can use the Antares client to query anything associated with it. 
You could report it to DNS automatically and then share your follow up like I showed you. And this isn't science fiction, we're doing this right now. So this was all done by a grad student, Patrick Aleo, along with a postdoc, Constantine Blanchard, working with Chen Shu Li. This is one of the objects that we have submitted to see DNS completely automatically. So Patrick's uh, anomaly detection filter code said that this looks like a supernova uh, and flagged it. It was reported to DNS completely automatically, no human in the loop. Uh, and then we went off and got a spectra of it right after that. Uh, and with not, and you can see that this is a uh, regular type 1A supernova. So this is cool, and it's not science fiction anymore. We can do this stuff, and it's happening more and more often. I'd say all of these systems are still under development, and there are changes happening, but it's a really good time to engage and get involved in it because they will evolve and become more and more sophisticated going forward. Uh, and that really enables you to write not just stronger science papers, but more interesting science proposals to say funding agencies or telescope proposals to try to convince uh, groups to give you time to do the sort of coordinated follow-up with CTA together with Ruben or Zwicky or any of the other facilities all at once. So it's a really, really interesting future that we have going for us. So that sort of brings me to how CTA can start to engage already. Now, you folks are in the middle of survey planning and designing but you must already have a catalog of sources that you can start uh, monitoring in other wave bands, the optical, for example, or if anything interesting happens in say ice cube or something of that nature. So for example, when I was a grad student, I'd go down to Mount Hopkins uh, all the time and, and take selfies of myself with the, the Veritas Observatory and Whipple. Uh, and I'm sure those things have given you a really good catalog of sources that you can already upload, for example, to Antares and start monitoring. And sort of Pathfinder facilities that are also at, at Whipple uh, are already a great source of alerts for testing. You don't have to go to millions of alerts every night. You can deal with just a few. And so if the CTA group wants to get into the sort of real time connecting a Pathfinder telescope with a broker system, please reach out to us. We will be happy to work with you to sort of publish your alerts. And we can even put little riders on them in the community and say, you know, we're still in test phase. So don't uh, necessarily go off and worry if you uh, think you might have suddenly identified the galactic supernova or whatever. Uh, there, there are caveats here. That's all already doable. And all the science use cases you folks are defining implicitly define the kind of sources that you're trying to find. And you can implement these sources as filters and we can help you develop them. There's already this dev kit that I showed you and the ability to run your own Python code or watch lists or whatever else, but you don't have to worry if the learning curve there seems too steep, just get in touch with us. We have a Slack space, we're very, very friendly. We will happily work with you and implement what uh, we think you need talking with you. Uh, and so there is a real way for this group to sort of engage already with what's happening in these other wave bands and really have CTA become part of this entire cyber ecosystem uh, for time domain science going forward. But I think there's actually even more that you can do with these broker systems and that's to optimize the survey that you're already planning and running. So we've known for a while, for example, that you can use machine learning to separate out variables and transient sources. So this was a interactive demo that was developed by Carlos Scheidegger and myself um, when I was at NOAA lab. And what you're seeing here are the two principal components for a whole bunch of variables in the linear and oval catalogs. And so as I'm moving around my mouse, you're seeing different variable stars and the same sort of things that you can get in a day is if you click on a particular object, you can get the postage stamp as well as all of the other information on there. Uh, but what's particularly interesting for us was that even in two dimensions, as long as you had the full light curve, I'm only looking at two PCA dimensions here, you can see typical classes of objects start to differ from each other. So RLIRA, for example, look very, very different from alcohols, and they really have different light curve shapes, and those features put them in a different part of principal component access space. You can also use this sort of technology to, say, identify outliers and, and see if anomalous objects are very far away. And so for a second, I'm going to you know, upload a known anomalous object that is uh, definitely going to be far away from the rest of the sample. And sure enough, it falls reasonably far away uh, and so on and so forth. So we knew that machine learning, if you have all of the data on a particular source can be used to separate things out. But how do you actually use that uh, to decide design your survey and make it better and use machine learning in real time as part of these broker systems. 
Our answer within Rubin was to do something called the photometric LSST astronomical time series classification challenge or PLASTIC. So PLASTIC ran uh, a couple of years ago on the Kaggle platform. It is to date the biggest uh, astronomy data challenge that's ever been run on Kaggle, which is uh, operated by Google. So we had $25,000 in uh, prize money for the general public to get engaged and do a photometric classification of the time domain sky using simulated LSST alerts uh, that we created, uh, except they were in the form of full light curves. And we had we made this as reasonably realistic as we could. Different kinds of time domain sources, things like tidal disruption events and MDOFs and supernova of different kinds, uh, MIRA variables, whatever else have you. Uh, and we simulated something like 3 million uh, VRO light curves and UGRICY, and we really wanted to jumpstart uh, photometric classification efforts. And in that respect, uh, this plastic effort has been tremendously successful. We've seen, uh, for example, things that uh, do Gaussian process interpolation and, and use uh, deep neural networks with these gated recurrent units here by Ashley Villar to identify uh, anomalies, objects. We've seen general purpose classifiers built out of them. The challenge was actually won by Kyle Boone, who's now, uh, who is an astronomer and is now a postdoc at the University of Washington. Uh, but he got really, really lucky and won right at the end. And if uh, if our victory conditions had been slightly different, an astronomer would not have won this challenge. A member of the general public would have, which is very, very cool. Now, if you believe the outcomes from plastic, you know, if, and you care about, say, Kilanova discovery, uh, this is not going to be a problem. Kilanova were really strongly well identified by pretty much every uh, of the major winning entries in Kaggle, all the top three had no trouble separating Kilonova out from any of the other classes. They had much more trouble classifying regular supernova and distinguishing them from each other. But what we know is that it will in fact be a problem in LSST. And why it isn't a problem in plastic is because of the limitations of the challenge itself. So LSST's cadence has this median internet gap of roughly four days across all filters or 10 days in a single filter. Uh, and that means that if you are trying to find something like a kilonova, which evolves very rapidly over a few days, you'll only get one or two points. But the classifier was, of course, seeing those one or two points and seeing other objects for a whole bunch of other points uh, and very quickly identified which things were kilonova simply by the paucity of that data. So classifier is really only good as what the training data you give them is and what the loss notion is. If you look at something on Antares, on the other hand, something like this sort of object I showed you earlier, what you get is not the full light curve, but rather a slow rise. And the thing that tells you that this is a real object is that you have this slow evolving rise over time. You don't get all of this at once. You see one alert one night, getting it brighter the next night, getting brighter in detection another band the third night. You see it's associated with the galaxy and you want to make all of those connections and use that information for your classification. So our goal for the plastic version two, which will happen this year, is to connect the LSST science community with the brokers. So instead of sending out full light curves as we have, what we will do this time is send out alert packets, the actual alert stream that you might get from LSST itself. And what we'll do is preserve environmental correlations. We'll have a representative sample of the alerts for training. And the brokers have all the broker teams, including Antares, as well as Alersi and Nasser and some of the other big uh, teams like Ample, will be working with us to store, process, and classify these alerts in real time. And we can have many different metrics. And so we can have the community involved with LSST science now become part of a verification and validation loop within desk to sort of ensure that we have compatibility between these broker systems and the LSST science collaborations. And this model, I think, works not just in LSST world, it'll work just as fine for CTA. And so surely folks in CTA are doing things like creating simulated uh, objects like that they will see in the sky. You can issue alerts on those simulations themselves through these broker teams. We will happily work with you to do that and see how well the community can actually identify them. And that has led to all sorts of interesting developments. So for example, if we uh, want to get away from simple light curve classification where you see the full light curve at 
once, you can now see what happens when you have an evolving alert stream of alerts. And you see this like curve evolve over time. Uh, I had a grad student, uh, Daniel Muthukrishna, who's just got his PhD a couple of weeks ago, uh, work on this. And he came up with a system called RAPID, or Real-Time Automated Photometric Identification. And you can see that as you see more and more alerts from this particular object, this classifier, this deep neural network, which has these great uh, recurrent units, evolves its classification over time. Uh, and says, for example, that this particular source looks uh, more and more like a uh, tidal disruption event. Um, we are also figuring out how to do our simulations with hosts. Uh, so we have the largest library of, of supernovae and other transients now uh, that we can find the correlations between the host environments of those transients and the sort of transients that they, they host uh, and encode that into our alert simulation. So now when you have alerts coming out from uh, LSSD for this plastic challenge, they are not just the light curves of the sources themselves, but they also have all the host information, including a posted stamp potentially associated with them. So you get color, you get redshift, you get radial moments, Cersei indices, uh, whatever else have you to go along with it, which really helps with classification. It makes this entire process more realistic. It gives us a lot more faith that we're using machine learning correctly and identifying the right sort of sources. And what we're doing with all of this is now already not just including only LSST data, but we are, as part of Plastic Version 2, simulating data from another survey, in this case, LIGO, Virgo, Kagra, SkyMaps. And so our entire machinery within LSST land is over here, but now we have this extra stream coming in in the form of LIGO alerts, which could also just as easily be CTA alerts if you folks are interested in working with us. And these will go to a whole bunch of brokers, which will rank and classify and do all of the things that I've been talking about in the slide and let you, the science community, actually see the output, see what is useful, tune your algorithms appropriately and really engage with the project as a whole. And as part of that, uh, within my own group, I, uh, I'm working with a postdoc, Deep Chatterjee, who's an Illinois survey science fellow here. And what we figured out is how to modify rapid to take not just the light curve, but also the entire sky map, the simulated sky map from Lyco, Virgo, Kagra, and use the sky map as effectively a prior to identify the subset of sources uh, in a survey like ZTF that are potentially kilonova uh, counterparts. So the electromagnetic counterparts to these binary neutron star mergers. And this sort of system works really, really well. Uh, we only have one real data set to uh, evaluate it on, which is the actual GW170817 data. Uh, but uh, applying LSID, which is this machine learning code now to the one real kilonova event that we have, uh, it seems to work perfectly. It identifies uh, the kilonova with the sky map and the light curve from DECAM without any trouble. So this really means that the next time we go into like 04 and 05 beyond that, we now have the tools to really find the counterpart much more quickly than we were able to for GW170817. So this sort of uh, lets me wrap up a little bit and with how I think CTA can engage in the last point. Every survey is creating these large simulations before they turn on what they expect to see into test survey design. And this is typically infrastructure work, so it's hard to get people to really be part of that. Uh, but you can engage the community scientifically. You just have to do the extra little work of taking those simulations and converting them into alerts and sending them out. And really that gives you a way to effectively write science papers out of what would have otherwise been considered pipeline development to take this, this core uh, software effort and make it into something that can really be into science papers. We are already in plastic version two including like over Gokagra together with NSST. And for version three as the, the plastic head now, I am would be thrilled to have CTA data simulated alerts uh, for that next data release, the next version of our data challenge. And so we'd love to work with you folks on getting this done. So I wanna end with a few, uh, just one other thing. Uh, this, this ecosystem is constantly evolving. So what I showed you now are real time analysis of data, um, but you might also want to do sort of 
archival reprocessing of data uh, or analysis on a large sample of data. And brokers themselves are evolving to sort of make this uh, happen. They're evolving into what we call research platforms that do all of the things that brokers do, but now also give you cloud-based computing. So you can reanalyze a whole bunch of data sets. You can do your data releases in the cloud. And I really think this is where the community is going to be going. I don't think we're going to have individual universities or projects run their own little HPC servers, uh, HPC centers and do annual data releases. I think instead what we'll have is ongoing living data releases that are constantly being updated with the real-time analysis that's happening. And, and it's we're moving away from traditional archives where you can download fits images to your laptop and do all sorts of analysis to these cloud-based environments where you do all of your analysis and visualization on the cloud. These things will all have a good identity and access management layer so you can share data with groups uh, either privately or make it more public all at once. Uh, and you can have real interfaces, not just uh, from surveys themselves, uh, but also between other facilities. And so you can have for example, follow up with things like Swift or, or the Las Cumbres Observatories, but potentially even the entire amateur uh, astronomy community can now become part of the science that you do. So it's really a very cool new world um, for what we're trying to do. Uh, so I'm gonna end with a few takeaways. So LSST and CTA then are uh, building on these current generation of service to discover many, many new sources. And I really think that maximizing the scientific utility from these experiments requires that we move away from sort of regular data releases to providing our data in real time so that people can start doing science right away. And this is particularly crucial if you're working on time domain science. Alert brokers are really a key tool, they're sort of the middleware that give communities ways to search the data and characterize and, and filter and find follow-up events. And they let you use machine learning, which is otherwise this really abstract thing uh, that seems to be done in the certain papers, but otherwise doesn't get used as part of your real-time survey operations. And so as CTA is building out its pipeline and it's creating these sort of simulations for survey designs and interacting with themes and scientific community, you can actually engage with this entire ecosystem already. You can define sort of interesting questions that spur people to go on and develop filters and machine learning codes for the CTA group and do that in our analysis. And I really do think that the best science is not going to come from individual surveys acting separately from each other, but when they act coherently in concert with each other. Uh, and that will really allow us to do this multi master astrophysics by combining real-time streams from certain experiments. It's very challenging, but I think this is a tremendous opportunity for the community. And I will end there.